Hi, and welcome back to Fundamentals of Bioinformatics. My name is Greg Caparaso. Today, we're going to cover a quick introduction to working on the Linux command line. We'll cover a few things. We'll start by talking about what the command line is and why you'd want to use it. We'll then talk about some, uh, some concepts of the file system, including relative and absolute paths, your home directory, and the root directory. Then we'll work through about 10 built-in commands that are the core commands that you need to know for interacting with the Linux command line. Along the way, I will show you some shortcuts um, that you can use to work more efficiently at the command line. At the end of today's lecture, you won't be an expert with these tools, but you'll have a fundamental understanding. And if you practice the techniques that I'm showing you, eventually you will develop comfort working with command line and command line software. Now, as we jump in, let me show you what I'm talking about when I talk about the command prompt. I have an example of a command prompt pulled up on my screen right now. I'm working on Mac OS, but you can find the same thing on Windows or on Linux um, or on most other operating systems. Now, this may look a little bit intimidating at first because um, this is just a big black box and apparently it's supposed to do something. Um, but let me just show you a little bit about what this is, um, how it works, um, and don't feel the need to follow along with what I'm doing yet. So when you're working on a command prompt, um, Basically, that means what it sounds like. The machine is prompting you to give it some command. Um, now, the, the specifics of the prompt are going to differ based on the machine that you're running on and how things are configured. What I have here is a very simple command prompt. So when I see this dollar sign symbol, um, that is the machine telling me that it's ready for me to give it a command. Um, I, next to this, I have um, what is a more typical interface that you might be used to seeing um, on your computer, and that is the macOS graphical interface, um, and in this case, the file system browser, or the finder. Um, and so if I were to type a, a command um, to see what folder I am currently in on the system, I would use a command called pwd. Again, don't um, worry about following along at this uh, moment. We're going to come back to this a little bit later. Um, but if I type pwd, that tells me that the location that I'm at, the current directory that I'm in on this system, is users Greg Caparaso temp. Um, and you can see I have this temp directory pulled up up here. Um, and a little trick on Mac OS is, for example, if I were to pull that over, um, so if I were to just pull this directory name over to my terminal, it'll display that full path for me. But you can see that it was the same location. So the command line and a graphical interface are really just two different ways of interfacing with the computer. Um, anything that I can do in the graphical interface, I can typically do in the command line interface. Anything I can do in the command line interface, I usually can get done um, in a graphical interface. Though the command line interface does tend to be a little bit more powerful and that's why many users, um, more advanced users might prefer it. Um, and so let me type a command here. Um, the command that I'm gonna enter it's called Vim, which is going to open up a text editor for me. And I'm going to tell it I want to open a file called hello.txt. And I'm just going to come in here and I'm just going to type hello. And I'm going to close that file. Now, if you're paying attention over on the right side of the screen, you may have noticed that something changed. So when I opened that new file, hello.txt, and edited it, once I save that, a new file popped up over here in the finder. Um, that's because, like I said, um, these are just two different views into the same system. So whether I'm interacting um, in the graphical interface or whether I'm interacting with the command line interface, I'm interacting with the same computer. Um, I'm gonna use another command, which um, is ls, and that lists the files in the current directory. And so if I type ls, I can see that I have hello.txt. Um, that ls command is essentially showing the same list that we would have over here 
um, in temp. And so let's say, for example, over here in the finder, I create a new, fold, a new folder and I call this stuff. If I come back over to my terminal now and I type ls, you can see that I have a new directory or a new folder, um, and that folder is called stuff. Um, if I um, were to, say, create a new file in stuff, so I will create a file called goodbye.txt. Um, whoops. Um, you can see that if I were to come back over to my finder, I would now have that new file in that directory. Um, and so the takeaway message here is that the command line interface and the graphical interface are just two views into the same system. When you interact with one, it'll have impacts on what you see when you're interacting with the other. As we work through that little example, you heard me mention a few times uh, file paths and directory paths or folder paths. Um, those are concepts that are fundamental to interacting on a command line and interacting with command line software. The reason is we're typically working with files when we're working on a command line. Those files might be, for example, data files that you are using as input to a program. They might be things like sample metadata files that you're using to describe samples and analysis, or they may even be source code files for a program that you're writing. But regardless, in order to efficiently work on a command line, you need to understand how to describe where files and directories are on that system in a way that will be understandable to the command line software. So next, we'll talk about files and directory paths. File paths specify the location of a file on your computer, while a directory path specifies the location of a directory on your computer. You can also, you may have also heard directories referred to as folders. Those two terms are synonymous, um, and most people end up going back and forth between using the term uh, folder and the term directory. I may do that myself in this workshop. The, um, either of these path types, um, so I'll generally call these paths, directory paths or file paths, can be relative, which mean uh, that their meaning is dependent on where you currently are on the file system, or they can be absolute, meaning that it, uh, their meaning is not relative to where you are on the file system. Um, they're rather fully specified with respect to the root of the file system. Now the root of the file system, um, otherwise known as the root directory, is a special directory that contains all of the other files and directories on the computer. The root directory is specified by having a slash at the beginning of, the, of a path. Um, and so if you see a path like the ones that I have below that start with a slash, that means that they are absolute file paths. So I've got three listed here. The first one is uh, specifying the root directory itself. The second one is specifying a special directory. Um, this would be my home directory on the file system. And so that would be slash home slash Greg. The last one is a file path that is underneath my home directory. So it's under slash home slash Greg. And this is a directory where I, can, uh, where I store photos of my chickens. I have one in there called Barbara.png. Barbara is one of my chickens. And so that would be a photo of her. Um, so I mentioned the location specified by an absolute path doesn't change meaning regardless of where you are on the file system. On the other hand, a relative path does change meaning depending on where you are on the file system. And so here you see two relative paths. The first one is chicken photos, that's a directory path. The second one is chicken photos slash Barbara.png, that's a file path. Notice that these do not start with a slash. And so that is a big hint to you that these are relative paths, not absolute paths. Now, I mentioned my home directory a couple of times. This is an important directory on the file system. 
This is generally where you would store your files. So like you saw, that was where I store my photos of chickens. Um, and it's also the directory that you'll be in when you log into the server. Um, so on Linux-based systems, the absolute path to your home directory is slash home slash username, where username is your name on the system. And so for me, that might be Greg. The home, your home directory is also abbreviated in a few ways that your computer will understand. Um, first, you'll often see it abbreviated as the tilde or squiggle, um, and you may also see it abbreviated as dollar sign home, all capital letters. Since these are abbreviations of an absolute file path, they work like file, they work like absolute file paths, even though they don't start with a slash. Now I'm going to start working through some of the important built-in commands that you can find on just about any command shell. There's about 10 commands here. Um, some of them might look a little bit confusing. Some of them um, sound a lot like what they do. Um, but if you can memorize these commands, that'll get you pretty far with uh, interacting with command line software. It'll get you started understanding how to move around the file system and manage files and directories. Now I'm going to do this in a terminal um, and it would help wh um, whether you do it right now or whether you come back to this later for you to follow along with what I'm doing. I think that'll give you a good basis in understanding how to interact with these commands. Um, before we do that, let's just talk about the anatomy of a command. So when you're providing a command to, to command line software, spaces are very important as they delineate different components of the command. Um, and so the most fundamental unit here is the command itself. In this case, um, the command that's being used in, as an example is ls, which means list directory contents. We saw that one in the example that I did a little bit earlier. The, um, the command can typically um, be provided on its own, or you can provide one or more options to that command. And the options are going to change the behavior of the command. And so um, with ls, they may, for example, provide some different information. We'll take a look at this in a minute. Um, or they may uh, modify how that information is presented to you. You can also provide arguments to a command. And arguments are something that the command is operating on. And so this last command in this list here, ls-al, uh, sorry, ls-lag, downloads is going to tell us the contents of the directory downloads rather than the contents of the current folder. And so it's some uh, argument that is changing what the command is operating on. So now that we have that, um, let's jump in and look at um, a hands-on demo. Okay, so I just took a minute to get logged into a Linux system that I could use to demo the command line. If you're taking, if you're watching this video as part of my Bio 450 class, you'll do this through the on-demand system, which will provide another video uh, where we illustrate how to connect to that system. If you're just watching this video on YouTube, you can do this on any Linux terminal uh, and potentially even a Mac OS terminal. So this command prompt looks a little bit different than the one that we saw a few minutes earlier in this video, but you can see the same idea. So there it still ends in a dollar sign. The information that's leading up to that is just some information that I have customized um, on my command terminal that I find helpful. Um, but the prompt itself, the command prompt, is that dollar sign at the end of the command. Now, the system that I am connected to here is a supercomputer that researchers have access to at my university. Um, and this system doesn't actually have a graphical user interface to interact with. Um, and so if I wanna access the software on this powerful computer to run, say, bioinformatics analyses, um, I need to know how to use the command line. 
This is a very common um, hurdle that many biologists run into. Um, the software that they want to use is either designed for command, uh, command line interface only, um, or the system that they need to use it is all command line based. Um, and so it's really helpful for you to develop um, these skills and um, be able to apply those skills so that you can run the analyses that you need to run without having to go get a lot of help from other folks. Um, now, while this might initially seem intimidating, like I mentioned earlier, there's really only about 10 commands or so that you need to memorize so that you can get around efficiently on this system. I'm gonna start working through some of those right now. The first command that I'm gonna show you is PWD, which stands for Print Working Directory. Um, and what that means is um, print the directory that I'm currently in on this file system. And so you can see that when I do that, I'm in this directory that's slash home slash JGC53. And so that's my home directory on this system. And so remember, that's that special directory that I mentioned earlier under which all of my files will typically be found. Now, um, the next command that I wanna show you is ls. So this is another one that we looked at a few minutes ago. Um, and if I type ls, that's gonna show a bunch of files and directories that I currently have in my home directory on this system. Um, and so for example, you can see I have a directory called bin, I have a directory called bio450, I have some files like bio450 python part onepynb um, and a few others. My terminal has a handy feature where it colors the directories and the files differently so that I can quickly tell which is which. Um, now we had looked at um, some example uh, variants of this command. Um, ls-a was one, and so that's where we add an option to a command. Um, and so if I type ls-a, in addition to um, the um, files that I just showed, it's showing some uh, hidden files in here as well. If I type ls-l, it shows this in um, a different format. And so rather than just showing me the file names, it's showing me some information like the date um, when they were last modified, it's showing me the file size, um, and so on, various other information, some of which um, is more important than others, and really uh, none of it you, uh, none of it is info that you really need right now. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna type a command called clear. Um, I don't have that one on my list, but what that does is it just clears the terminal. It makes it so that I don't have all that distracting information in front of me anymore. Um, and I'll type ls one more time just to see what we have in here. Now, I wanna demo some things for you. And so the easiest way to do that will be for me to create a new folder or directory that I can do this demo underneath. And so I'm gonna type mkdir, which means make directory. And for the first time, I'm gonna pass an argument to a command that we're using. And so I'm gonna call this demo. So I'm gonna make a directory called demo. Nothing happened here, um, at least that I can see. Um, and I know that because the command prompt just came back to me. So I typed that command and then I got my command prompt back again. Now, this is very commonly how command line software works. If everything worked successfully, it doesn't give you any output. It just prompts you for the next command. But this can be confusing for users who are new to this, um, who might be wanting some sort of information back that what they did actually worked. That information that it worked is you getting that command prompt back. And so if I type ls, you'll see that I now have a new directory here called demo. So the next command I'm gonna show you is cd, which is change directory. So if I type cd demo, that is going to move me into that directory that I just created. And if I type ls, you can see that I don't have any files in that directory yet. 
Now you may have noticed that my command prompt um, has been changing as we go here. Um, most notably, it changed from having a tilde up here to saying demo um, after I changed into the demo directory. So if you remember just a few minutes ago, I mentioned that the tilde was, uh, was a shortcut for my home directory. And so if you sort of put these ideas together, um, you can um, guess that what is happening is my command prompt is including information about the directory that I'm in. Um, and so that's helpful. I find that helpful for keeping track of where I am on the file system. Now, the cd command is um, pretty fancy. It has some fancy um, modes of operation associated with it. Um, and so, for example, if I type cd and don't provide any arguments to it, no matter where I am on the command or on the file system, it's going to take me back to my home directory. And so that's a handy one to keep track of. Um, I'll show you some other variants on that as we go. Um, but I just hit CD demo, and that brought me back to my demo directory. Now, the next thing I might want to do is create a file to work with. Uh, and the text editor that we're going to use on this system is called nano. And so I'm going to type just nano on the command line, and that's going to open up a nano buffer where I can start writing some text. And so I'm going to type something like the following. Um, Okay, so imagine I just created this silly file with a bunch of these different lines in it. Now, the um, remember, since we're working with command line software, we can't just drag our mouse and go to save somewhere. Everything that we're doing has to be based on keyboard input. And so if we want to write this file, and so if we want to take this um, basically untitled document at this point, and save it on our file system so that we can come back to it later or do something else with it, we need to do um, what is indicated on the bottom as write out. And so we want to write this file to disk. Um, and so the way that you access that is you'll hit the control key. And so that is where that um, like caret symbol is. Um, and you'll do control and then the letter O. Um, and that'll prompt me to give um, the file name to write. Um, and so I'm going to call this abc.txt. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and type that in. I'm going to hit enter. And now that wrote 27 lines, it's telling me to file. So now that I wrote this file, I'm going to hit control X. So I see that down at the bottom left of the screen. And so I'm going to hold my control key down and I'm going to hit the X and that'll bring me back to my command prompt. And so if I type LS, I can now see that I've got that new file abc.txt. Um, so the next command that I'm going to show you is a command called head. And if I type head abc.txt, that's going to show me some of that file that I just created. Specifically, what it's going to do is it's going to print the first 10 lines of that file to the terminal. Um, and so you can see um, it's got the first hello world, um, command line software is fun, H-E-L, and then that is the first 10 lines of the file. There's another useful command um, called tail. I bet you can guess what tail does. Um, it shows the last 10 lines of a file. Um, and so now you see this is a test, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, and that's all. 
And so that's the last 10 lines of the file that I have in here. And so head and tail are useful if you just need to get a glimpse of the information that is in a really big file. If you want to, um, in a similar way, be able to view the information that is in the entire file interactively, you can use a command called less. And so if I type less abc.txt, um, that is going to um, bring up this interactive browser. This is not a very long file, um, so it all fits on my terminal at once, but normally you would scroll up and down to um, view the entire contents of this file. When you're done using less, you just hit the Q um, character to exit. Okay, so let's um, make um, a few other files and directories in here. And so I'm going to make a directory called subdirectory1. Um, I will go back and adjust my spelling and hit enter. Um, and then I will make another file. I'm going to show you a different way to use nano here. So if I do nano and I type a file name on the command line, what that's going to do is it's going to create that new file for me. It's not going to be untitled now, though, because it's going to have this file name, which I provided on the command line. Okay, um, and I hit a, um, I did something wrong there. Um, it is prompting me, uh, telling me that it's recording a macro, which is not what I intended to do. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna try and hit Control X to get out of there. It seemed like that worked. Um, so I'm going to save modified buffer. So that basically means like, do you wanna save the changes that you made to this file? I'm gonna say yes. Because I gave it a file name before, it's now prompting me with the file name to write, and so I can just hit enter, and that'll bring me back to the command, um, to the command prompt, or the command terminal. Um, now let's, just for fun, cd into subdirectory one, and I'm gonna create a new file called xyz. and just write one line of text. Um, I'm gonna hit Control X to exit, um, Y to save the file, and then enter to accept the current name of the file. Okay, so now if I wanna see where I am on the system, I can use that command that I showed you earlier, PWD. And that's gonna show you that I'm now in home JGC53 demo subdirectory one. Um, so, what if I want to get back to CD demo? Well, there's a few ways to do that. Um, I could type CD, and then I'll be back in my home directory, and I could type CD demo, and now I'm back in demo. But that was a little bit clunky. So imagine I was back in that CD subdirectory one, um, and I want to get back to demo. So I basically want to go um, one directory up from where I am right now. Well, CD has a shortcut for that, and that is typing CD dot dot. And what that means is go one directory up from where I currently am on the file system. Um, and so now you see that that puts me back in the demo directory. Now, you may have just noticed that I did something um, where I typed CD sub, and then somehow I got it to auto-complete the whole rest of that directory name for me. Um, what I did was I hit the tab key, 
And the reason that worked is that when I was in the demo directory, so let's just, let's clear the terminal again here and type ls. And so now, um, if I were to type, say, cd su and hit tab, what the, what the terminal is able to do is it's able to auto-complete the directory name for me because that directory name is unique in here. And so there's nothing else in this directory that starts with SU. And so if I hit tab, it can automatically complete that for me. Um, and so that is a really handy shortcut um, for uh, working on the command line. Um, so let me go back to my demo directory and type ls again. Um, so ls is handy, you will use it constantly. Um, there's another command that's also helpful for visualizing director directories recursively. So meaning like you can see what's in the content of the directories that are contained in the current directory. Um, this command you may not always find on your system, but it's a handy one if you do. Um, it's called tree. And if I type tree, it's going to give me a sort of somewhat visual representation of what we've got here. Um, and so the dot in this case, so the dot that's being shown up here represents the current working directory, the directory that we're currently in. And what this is telling me is that under this directory, there's a file called abc.txt, there's a file called def.txt, and then there's a directory called subdirectory1, and in that directory, there's a file called xyz.txt. And so you can see that this is showing um, sort of this hierarchical view, starting with the current directory of all the files and directories that are underneath the current working directory. Okay, so let's say um, I created these files abc.txt and def.txt. Um, and I decide I don't want, I don't like those names or I want to move them somewhere else on the file system. Um, the way that you can do either of those things is using a command called mv, which stands for move. And so if I decide that I want to rename abc.txt, the way that that happens um, is you would move that file. Um, and so let's call this one um, ghi.txt. And so here you can see that this command is taking two arguments. It's taking the file that I want to move and the place that I want to move it to. And so if I type ls again, or let's use, well, yeah, um, let's use tree, just because I just showed you that. Um, you can see that I have def, I have ghi, and then I haven't done anything with that subdirectory. Um, and if I type head gh, ghi.txt, you can see that this is that content that we originally had in the abc.txt file. Um, similarly, if I wanted to move a file from the current directory into a subdirectory, I could do that. I made use of that tab completion in both cases there. Um, and I'm going to clear the terminal and I'm going to type tree again. And you can see that what I did was I moved that file, def.txt, from my current directory into subdirectory one. Now, another really handy shortcut. Um, if I want to see what commands I have previously run, I can use the up arrow on my keyboard. Um, and so, for example, I now have um, scrolled through my command history, um, and I can see that I ran tree, before that I ran clear, and before that I ran this move command. Um, if there's a command I want to run again, when I scroll to it in my history, I can just hit enter and it'll run that command again. Okay, so I now have ghi.txt in this directory and then I've got some other files in subdirectory one. 
Now let's say I want to make some edits to ghi.txt, but I want to have a backup. I want to do that in a new file. Um, so what I would want to do is I would want to copy ghi.txt, and I can do that with the command cp. And so if I type cp ghi.txt and then ghi new.txt and then ls again, you can see that I now have a copy of that file. If I type head ghi.txt, I'll see the text in that file. If I type head, and this, this is actually interesting here, so watch what happens here. So I'm gonna type gh, I'm gonna type g, and I'm gonna hit tab. This time, it only completed to ghi. So first, let's just see what happens if I well, no, let's, um, let's finish talking about this first. So why didn't it auto-complete this whole command? The reason is because there are more than one file in this directory that start with GHI. And so if I hit tab twice in a row, it'll show me what those different options are. Um, and so you can see it doesn't know whether it should autocomplete ghi-new or ghi.txt. So if I give it a hint, if I type the next character, so I type a dash, now it's unique, and so now it can autocomplete that. And so if I type head ghi-new.txt, it'll show me the contents of that, that file. So let's open that new file up. Um, for editing in nano and I am going to just put a note at the top here that says this is my copy and I'm going to hit control X I'm going to say yes um, and if I now scroll up to head ghinew.txt you can see that that is now the copied version. Um, and if I scroll back to head ghi.txt, you can see that is the original version. Now, what if I tried to do something like this? Um, so I hit the typed head and then ghi, and then I didn't type anything else, and I hit enter. Here, I'm getting an error. Um, and so this is where um, the command line software usually starts to feel really intimidating for folks. Um, and so um, if you get an error like this, um, you know, sometimes this will be um, pretty self-evident. Sometimes you won't know um, exactly what's going on. And so it's helpful to copy that error message and Google it. And that's usually what I'm doing when I encounter an error message that I don't understand. Um, so what this particular error message is telling me is that there's no such file or directory as GHI. Now if we look in our directory, um, we'll see that GHI in fact does not exist. The only files in here are GHI.txt and GHINew.txt. And so there isn't actually a file that is called GHI. And so the command line interface is very literal, very exact. Um, and so um, in this particular case, um, it doesn't, it is not aware of a file called GHI. And so it's not able to print out the first 10 lines of it when we call head. And so it's giving us an error message. Um, let me show you something similar while we're looking at this. So what if I typed head ghi.txt and so, whoops, um, and so I'm doing that all in caps. What do you think is going to happen here? Same thing, we're getting an error message because there is no file here with all caps called ghi.txt. Um, and so most command terminals that you interact with are going to be case sensitive, meaning that lowercase and uppercase are diff mean different things. 
There are some exceptions to this, um, but for the most part, you should just get in the habit of um, treating the command line uh, and anything you type on the command line as case sensitive. And so if it's lowercase, then you should use lowercase. Okay, so we've gone through most of these commands now, um, and there's just two last ones that I wanna show you. Um, and these ones you have to be very careful with. Um, Let's say now I'm done working with these files and I want to clean them up. I want to remove them from the file system. The command that I would use for this is rm. Um, and let's say I want to remove that ghi-new.txt. Um, I would type rm and then I would pass that file name as the argument. And then if I type ls, you can see that that file is gone. Now this is really important. There is not a concept of like a recycle bin or trash can on Linux. And so, and really with a command terminal in general. And so you really have to mean it when you type RM. Once you remove that file, it is not gonna be possible to retrieve it. This is a permanent action that you're taking. Um, so just be aware of that. Um, if you wanted to remove a directory, um, you might think I just type rm subdirectory one, um, but rm does not remove a directory, and so I get an error message here. Um, in the command list that I gave you, I show how you um, handle this, and you do that by providing an option. And so here, I'm gonna say rm-r subdirectory one, and that means recursively remove this. So that means remove everything that's under this and the directory. And so if I do that, I type ls, I can see that all I have left is that ghi.txt. Um, so again, be very careful with um, the rm commands. They are permanent and they can cause you to lose information. Okay, so that was a really quick overview of how to interact with files in the file system uh, at a Linux command line. Like I started with, um, you may not have followed along with this section, but I do recommend going back and following along. Um, and so the more experience you get typing these commands in, and like it or not, the more experience you get encountering errors when you do that, the more proficient you're gonna become using this tool. Um, and so again, if you didn't follow along, I recommend getting a terminal up and following along with this demo. Okay, so that's where I wanna wrap up for today. We covered a lot of ground, including learning about the file system and absolute and relative paths, and learning a handful of commands that you can use to get around on the Linux command line. But you're really gonna learn this by using these uh, tools and techniques. And so anytime you get a chance, I would recommend jumping in and trying to practice this a little bit. We'll do this a lot throughout the remainder of the course. All right, thanks and I'll see you next time.